Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first in our series of lectures about the Old Testament. Uh, today, we're going to be covering the Pentateuch. Now, remember, these lectures, these online lectures, are meant to be uh, just kind of brief explorations of a few topics. Obviously, we're not in the next 25 minutes or so going to be able to do any sort of exhaustive covering of the material that we could talk about for the Pentateuch. There simply is way, way too much to do. So what we're really going to be doing is picking up on a couple of specific issues and talking a little bit about those. I would encourage you uh, to... Uh, if you have questions or thoughts about other issues, raise those in the online uh, class discussion space. That's what that's there for. And talk about that with your classmates. I'll do my best to respond as well to some of your questions and to promote discussions in that forum. Uh, remember also that this is meant to be done in conjunction with the readings from the Bible and from the Brueggemann and Linnefeld book assigned in the syllabus. Keeping up with those readings will make these uh, lectures make a lot more sense and, and help you to get a good bit more out of them. So today, when we're talking about the Pentateuch, the Pentateuch is, of course, the first five books of the Bible, beginning with Genesis and running through the book of Deuteronomy. It's also called the Torah in Jewish tradition because this is the uh, part of the, of the Bible that contains the bulk of the legal or instructional material. Um, from the span of the narrative, this covers quite a large chunk of time, right? Because it begins with the creation of the world and ends with the children of Israel poised to enter the promised land. And likewise, uh, it also contains a lot of different kinds of materials, right? So uh, if we have the sections of creation and primordial history and that of the patriarchs and matriarchs, the exodus, the legal material, uh, all of these uh, span not only different uh, times as far as the narrative is concerned, but also different genres of material, of prose narrative, of poetic sections, of legal material. All, all of these are contained in the Pentateuch. Um, and we could talk for really a very, very long time about any one of these individual chunks, but we just don't have that kind of space in this class. So we're going to have to pick up on a couple of issues and uh, go from there. So I'd like to begin, first of all, with the Patriarchs and Matriarchs section. This is the uh, section of Genesis starting in chapter 12 and running through the end of the book. And this section really describes the actions and the stories of the, you know, kind of heroes of the faith, right? And so we're talking about Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob, Leah, Rachel, Joseph, his many brothers, all of these folks, the, the ones that are familiar to you from the many stories that you've uh, certainly read and heard. Uh, throughout your life. So the right, as we said, right, these are the heroes of the faith. These are the, the ones that are ancestors, the ones that come before us, the, the ones whose examples we seek to emulate. Or are they? Right? So what's curious about some of these stories is that some really do show off the exemplary character of them, right? Um, this, but there are others that really show them doing some rather questionable things. Abraham, right, um, is the model of faith. He's the one who picks up and leaves everything behind when he's summoned by God. And he, does, and he does so without even so much as questioning what God is doing. Um, he also demonstrates this really wonderful capacity for justice, barg bargaining with God over the lives of the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18, uh, where he consistently lowers the threshold that God would need to meet to uh, avoid the destruction of the city if, if certain numbers of righteous people are found there. Um, but this is the same Abraham who disguises his wife as his sister, not once, but twice. Uh, incidentally, Isaac does the same thing a little bit later on, right? The same Abraham who banishes his mistress and his firstborn son into the wilderness. And the same Abraham who nearly sacrifices the other son uh, without so much as a questioning word when God tells him to do this. Okay, what about the others, right? There's Jacob. Jacob, who tricks his father into giving him the blessing instead of his older brother. And even though they become reconciled later on in life, this is certainly the point of, uh, or certainly a point of contention in the narrative. Um, 
And really, if we were to list all of the strange and questionable things that Jacob's sons do, we'd really be here all day. So, what are we to make of these people? Um, the ones who are supposed to be our ancestors, and, and as we've often heard them, the heroes in our faith. Um, are they just fundamentally flawed? Um, couldn't God have found better people to do these things? Well, Perhaps that's the wrong question. Perhaps it's not a matter of whether or not it would have been possible for God to find better characters, for God to choose better people um, to begin the story of God and God's particular people. Perhaps that's the wrong question. Perhaps it's not the question of whether it would have been possible for God to do so, but whether it would have been better for God to do so. The funny thing about all of these folks in Genesis is that it is precisely their imperfection, in their imperfection, that their hum uh, humanity shines through. And even more than that, does God's grace through them shine through. They're not perfect superheroes who vanquish both foe and temptation and evil at every turn, but deeply flawed people who nevertheless find themselves blessed by God. Oftentimes they get it right, including in really, really big ways, and it's important to see that. But it's also important to see that at other times they screw up. But even in the ways that they screw up, they cannot jeopardize God's plan and the, and the grace that it is exhibited through that plan. Now, the good news for us, I think, is that this makes for really, really wonderful sermon material. Um, these characters are so relatable precisely because of their flaws. And it's also something that I would encourage you to bring up and uh, discuss with each other in the discussion uh, area. Uh, are there particular texts that you find inspiring? Are there others that you find troubling? Uh, and what ultimately are we to make of these folks that we call the patriarchs and the matriarchs of our faith? Okay, our second topic this morning is the topic of the legal material. Uh, now, I've picked this because this is one of the places where Christians are oftentimes um, a little nervous to tread, right? Uh, I have known many, many uh, a person who has set out to read the Bible from cover to cover with the best of intentions. And more often than not, uh, these folks get through Genesis without so much of, so much of a problem, and they get through Exodus. Towards the end, they start to kind of flag a little bit, and then they get to Leviticus, and that's where the project ends. Uh, and what it is, is it's the legal material that they, they get into, and they just kind of can't get through it. So... Um, this is one of the one of those areas where we really ought to talk about what this stuff is and what it means and how we can deal with it. So uh, there are a couple of points that I really want to emphasize today. Um, one, this is the largest section of material in the Pentateuch, right? So it's not something that we should just start throwing away because if we do so, we're going to be throwing away an awful lot of texts. Um, two. The legal material in the Bible is presented not just as legal material on its own, but as legal material that exists as part of the covenant. And this really is a point that should not be missed. Um, the law is a covenant. That is to say, it is a relationship that is formed between God and God's people. Now, this relationship does not imply equality between the two parties, right? God remains the initiator, the protector, the guarantor of the covenant. Uh, and it is God whose role is that of the sovereign in the uh, in the covenantal relationship. But the covenant does imply a certain amount of vulnerability that exists in relationship. Um, and it is significant that uh, it is God that desires and initiates this relationship. Uh, and if we need any more evidence of that vulnerability, we need only look to the prophets and see their uh, the God who is in pain and is in anger because of the neglecting of the relationship by the other covenant partner. 
Uh, one of the other issues of law is that it has oftentimes been set up, particularly by our brothers and sisters in the Lutheran tradition, as a strong juxtaposition, that there are times of law and there are times of grace, or areas of law and areas of grace. Um, just a quick note about that, that that is not historically how the Reformed tradition, how our own tradition has understood it, but it is one that is um, kind of creeped in nevertheless. Um, so be aware that that uh, you may personally have this uh, understanding, or even if you don't, you're very likely to have folks sitting in your pews that, that think uh, in this kind of dichotomy of law versus grace. But it's not one ultimately that I find very helpful. And as we talk about it today, I think we're, what we're really going to see is, or what I'm going to argue for certainly, is the way in which Grace runs throughout all of the material of the Bible, including and perhaps even especially the legal material. Okay, um, so more on that in just a minute. Uh, but in the meantime, I also want to bring up one other thing that has been kind of prominent in the modern era as um, particularly Christians, although it's not limited only to Christians, but this has been a, a very a strong way that Christians have tried to work and maintain the relevance of legal material. Uh, and this has to, been to separate into categories, separate the law, that is, into categories of moral and ethical laws on the one hand and ritual and liturgical laws on the other. Um, the implication being that the moral ethical laws are still applicable, whereas the ritual liturgical laws are things that can be discarded. Um, there's a problem with this, and that there's a really big problem with this, and that the biggest problem is simply that uh, this is a, a distinction that is not native to the Bible itself. That is, um, if we're going to talk about these categories of moral ethical versus ritual liturgical, uh, it at the very least must begin with the the recognition that these are categories that are being imposed on the Bible by interpreters uh, who, who are themselves struggling with the text. Now, that's not necessarily a, a fatal flaw. We, we all do this, um, but it, we need to recognize that there's no distinction in the Bible where it says, okay, now we'll deal with the ethical laws and then, okay, break. Now we're dealing with the ritual and liturgical laws. Rather, they are presented as part of a coherent whole in the legal section. Okay. Um, if, however, this is an external way of... Um, or an external categorization of uh, the types of laws that exist, there is one sense in which I think that this distinction is actually quite helpful when we're dealing with uh, the interpretation and, and the analysis of laws, and that is in, a, in helping us to get at a discussion about purity. Um, and I bring this up because this is a really, really, really important thing when we're talking about the legal material, in particular the legal material in Leviticus and in uh, specific sections of Leviticus that are oftentimes referred to as the Holiness Code. Um, it's also really important because this is one of those areas where the understanding that undergirds the Bible is very, very different from our own cultural understanding in the contemporary West especially. Um, and this can make reading the legal material very, very difficult, uh, in part because the legal material does not go through and explain its worldview. It simply assumes it, it and it kind of understands that you assume it as well, even though now, of course, we, we don't. Um, it's not to say, though, that it can't be teased out, but that teasing out requires a good bit of intentionality, um, especially when it comes to making explicit both the, the assumptions that underlie the biblical text and our own cultural assumptions that we bring to the text. So let's start with that latter category of our own cultural assumptions for, for a few moments. For modern Western Christians, and this is certainly not universally true, but I'm going to generalize a little bit just to try and help us get at this some. Um, for modern Western, I'm going to go ahead and add American um, 
Christians. Uh, purity is a concept that is not often discussed except for a very kind of set of limited issues and primarily the issue uh, ar around which we discuss purity is really an issue of sexuality if you'll think about uh, the for example the purity ring uh, this is one of the ways that this term gets kind of thrown around um, but we also generally speaking for the limited times that we do talk about purity we generally collapse purity in into moral categories and language. We equate purity with morality. That is, if one is being morally upright, one is being pure, or uh, the opposite of that, if one is being immoral, or one is impure, then one is being immoral. Um, that's not necessarily the case with ancient notions of purity, and this is true of the Bible as well. Um, rather than being primarily about good behavior or uh, specifically a chaste sexual lifestyle, though these are parts of uh, issues of purity, purity in the Bible is primarily concerned with the radical holiness of God. That ho it's that holiness that causes places, people, and things to be set apart and separated from the rest of the world that do not share that standard of holiness. And there, there are levels here. It's not just a, a, a binary of holy versus unholy, but there are levels of, of holiness. So as such, we, and we can see this in, for example, the very architecture of the temple, right? Uh, there are areas of more and more of graduating holiness. So when you have the outside of the temple, that's kind of a least holy area, and then the, in the courtyard, and then the inner parts, and finally you get to the, the holy of holies, you may have heard this term. Um, the Hebrew that underlies this uh, is probably better translated, not just the holy of holies, but the holiest place. It is that superlative language there. Um, and this place is so, so holy that only the high priest may enter, and he may do it only once a year, and he must undergo these really, really extensive purification rituals in order just to go into this place. If he were not to do this, to do otherwise, that is, to just kind of enter haphazardly would be to risk having the extreme holiness of God come into contact with things that are profane, with things that are not of that level of extreme holiness. And this is something that could, in this worldview, bring about disastrous con uh, consequences. And if you're kind of curious about uh, what some of those consequences are, the book of Ezekiel uh, shares this worldview and is really and is working through a lot of these issues of what happens when the protected holy areas are perforated and uh, the profane things come in. Uh, and this view is really not limited to the temple and to the uh, the apparatus that surrounds the temple. Instead, it really covers a lot of areas of life, particularly for those that are, are related to the temple and to the uh, ritualistic religious lifestyle. Um, uh, for example, it covers issues of diet. Um, that is, there are animals that are clean and there are animals that are unclean. Uh, and those that are, are clean are fit for consumption. Uh, whereas those that are unclean uh, cause defilement and are therefore taboo. And here we can really see this quite nicely, that these categories of morality and purity are really not the same thing. They're not identical, though there may be some overlap at times. That is to say, there's nothing immoral about a pig. Okay, uh, it's not an evil creature. It didn't do anything wrong. It didn't create. Uh, it didn't. Ca it, it did not itself um, have any some sort of, sort of strange sin, and it is not. Uh, it does not fit into the category of what we would call bad. Right? It didn't do something immoral. What it is is impure. Why? Because it is. Um, it probably has to do in this particular case with it having certain features that are out of the ordinary for animals of its type but uh the real in in many ways a lot of that is kind of irrelevant what what matters is that it is impure and it and that it be recognized as being impure or unclean 
So um, relatedly then, eating pork, uh, according to this worldview, is not a moral problem in the sense that it doesn't make the person who does it bad or sinful, right? I don't, I don't become a bad person for for eating pork, what I do become if I eat pork, according to this worldview, is I become unclean. Uh, that is, that the uncleanliness, the impurity of the pork is transmitted by the food into the person who eats it. And so therefore, I take on a certain category of impurity. Uh, and what this in turn does is it renders me unfit to have certain types of interactions with certain levels of holiness, right? because I then risk mi uh, mixing the holy and the impure. Now, I, I, this can be reversed, right, through, through purification rites, through other, other means. Um, I can return to a state of purity. So it's not a, a uh, kind of one and done category. It's something that can, that can fluctuate and does fluctuate over time. Um, so this is one of those areas where it really is vital for us to recognize that the cultural understanding that produced the biblical text, uh, and these biblical texts, is really, really quite different from our own cultural standing. So uh, there are a couple of, of consequences of this, or at least that I would hope. Uh, on the one hand, I would really hope that this would prompt the church to work towards understanding a bit more how the ancients viewed purity and holiness. That is, we need to do our homework a little bit better on this. Uh, these were really, really culturally important texts for Israel. Uh, and for those that claim the Bible as our heritage, it's important that we take them seriously. On the other hand, it really should also give us caution that finding within them normative practices is not quite as simple as simply holding up the text and saying the Bible says so. That is, it requires a good bit more work on our hand, and it may not simply be self-evident of as an example of normative practice. Which leads us to the question of can or how can modern Christians make use of the law? Um, so it is essentially impossible for us to recover and claim precisely as our own the cultural uh, assumptions and intuitions and institutions that shape many of the laws that we find in the Old Testament. So, for example, right, wearing the cloths of two different fabrics. This is probably not something that we're really chomping at the bit to reclaim or arguably that it is even necessary for us to reclaim. Uh, but on the other hand, there are really, really important and foundational parts of the legal material that we, we really don't want to get rid of, right? We, we want to hold these things up as being not only important, but central to who we are as, as Christians. Uh, so the Ten Commandments, right? Th these are really important things. Um, and we see these as as, as being as applicable now as they ever were. Um, so how do we resolve this tension? How do we figure out the stuff that matters versus the stuff that perhaps uh, we we kind of hold as a part of our history but don't uh, understand as being normative today? Uh, so, one, I think we have to do away with the phrase, because the Bible says so here. Um, it's just not particularly helpful oftentimes. We do want to say things are important, and we want the Bible to be central for, for part of this, but you can't just pick it up and throw it at somebody. Um, instead of uh, simply pointing out these kind of isolated pieces of ancient legislation without any larger framework as to how they worked in the ancient world and how they might work for us now is uh, being overly rigid and providing such an unworkable reading of the law um, that we really are left with very little. And at worst, we may even be removing the workings of grace of the living God from our own lives. Uh, instead, I want to take a cue from something that a teacher of mine once said. Um, uh, I took a class with Alan Cooper, who's now dean at the Jewish Theological Seminary. This was a class on uh, Jewish biblical interpretation. And uh, he, he one day in class, he, he looked at us and he said, you do understand, right, that the Bible is not normative for practices for Jews. And what he means by this 
is not that Jews don't take seriously the Bible when they're they're trying to deal with how to find the rules about living their lives. In fact, he means exactly the opposite. What he means is that you can't just go to the Bible and find the rules there, right? Instead, uh, if one wants to find what in the Jewish tradition is called the halakha, the rules for living, one has to look at other materials, the Talmud, the Mishnah Torah, the, the kind of body of literature that accumulates over the over the development of the religious of the religious tradition that deals with the biblical material and works it into a way in which one can live one's life in the contemporary world of, of the text that we're talking about. The Bible is not thrown out by any stretch of the imagination. It's taken in enormously seriously. But you can't just pick it up and say this is this is what it says. Um, now, I also want to say that not all of our Jewish brothers and sisters would agree with those things that Professor Cooper has claimed, um, but I, I think we can also take his claim and use it as something that is instructive for Christian theology as well. Um, and in particular, uh, we, we may want to look as Christians, not surprisingly, to uh, the teachings of Jesus when we start to understand the law. So right in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus claims in the Sermon on the Mount that he is not there to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, right? And likewise, when Jesus is asked what the most important commandments of the law are, he quotes the law, um, in that the, those commandments to love God and to love neighbor are the ones that are the central features of, of the law and are most important. Uh, and therein lies a possible hermeneutic for Christians to reapproach and reappropriate that law, I think. Um, that it is the law that keeps us in relationship with God and with each other. Um, so related to that, it's also vital for us to remember that law and grace, to return to this that we, we talked about briefly, law and grace are not concepts that can be separated, at least in the view of the Old Testament. Uh, it is significant from the perspective of the narrative that where we find all of this legal material is in the place following the deliverance of the people from Egypt. God has first heard the cries of the people, is moved to compassion, and acts to deliver them. And it is at that moment, and only at that moment, that the law is delivered. That is, God's grace has already been demonstrated at the moment the law is given. The law is therefore a continuation of that grace, intending to solidify the relationship between God, God's people, and the way that those people will relate to each other. That's about all the time we've got for today. Um, so what I would encourage you to do is to take some of these issues and discuss them a little bit further in our discussion page. Um, uh, consider, for example, how the church should talk about the law and the role that it should have in the church's discussion about uh, about living. Um, what does it mean to, uh, to live a Christian lifestyle and to uh, bring in the law to that? Um, are there sections of legal material that you find easier to deal with than others? And why is that the case? Uh, what do we what do we do with them? Uh, next week, we'll be covering the Deuteronomistic material, so stay tuned for that. And um, watch out for emails that I'll be sending around about our upcoming exegesis session. Thanks.